Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is <coughs> John Wade. I'd like to welcome you all here. This is the fourth in a series of breakfasts, which is sponsored by the College of Law and also by the Law Foundation. And there are two more to come in, uh, one in February and one in March. And I'm glad to see that some of you made it here because as we speak, the Australian Open Tennis Tournament blazes on. Uh, <laughs> the match between Warinka and Djokovic was still going as I left for here, so uh, I don't know the outcome, but uh, wonderful spectacles there. Uh, in front of you, you should have uh, a paper, a hard copy of a paper, and also on a yellow sheet, an advertisement for a, a class that's being done at the college, but uh, we decided to ask uh, people to also come along to the class. So if you're interested in that, if you're a family lawyer or you know someone who's a family lawyer, this seems to be a hot topic at the moment in uh, Canada. As well, there should be another bubblegum card for you, um, a green one, and y you'll get two more of those in the co if you come to the later classes. But I'd like to walk you through this uh, great topic, which is dealt with in many disciplines and in many practices apart from lawyers. Uh, if you're in business, uh, if you're in selling international trade, if you're a parent, uh, all kinds of uh, professions deal with persuasion. And there are many subtopics within this paper, so I'll walk you through and try to uh, highlight certain things. So starting uh, with this question on the board is really the question of whether you can systematize human behavior, whether it's a black box, whether we're a mystery, or it's possible to create categories of meaning. And uh, as, as an academic uh, and, and as a practitioner, I'm hoping that there are categories and they have been of great help to me, but also there is mystery. And at the end of a mediation or a negotiation, you look back and sometimes ask what happened there? Uh, what were the dynamics? And you can't turn it into a system, just something happened in the mystery of human behavior. So uh, you'll see at, on page one, um, there is a framework for the paper. Uh, the first few pages deal with the boundaries of the, the word persuasion and how many twists there are in that word and takes you on then to basic negotiation patterns and then creating doubt by rights, goals and power. You'll see uh, on the first page the, the name about a third of the way down, Cialdini. If you put a circle around that, um, I'll be emphasizing uh, Robert Cialdini's work and he um, has been very helpful to me and he has done cross-cultural studies in what are the common factors that persuade people from <coughs> different countries and he's come up in predictable fashion with six factors which I'll mention to you but really try to whet your appetite to read his great book. He's one of these social psychologists who's been able to make learning fun and he is very skilled at, at that. So we'll go on to look at deception as self-deception and deception of the others, which creates such a, a pause in relation to persuasion because we fear being deceived. And then finally look at the very important concept of intangibles. All right, page, page one, a working description of persuasion about halfway down an attempt to change the beliefs, emotions, and behaviors, including the language of others. So we're attempting to change people and in their beliefs, their emotions, and their behaviors. And, and of course, you can persuade people by lots of other methods apart from uh, negotiation uh, or mediation. You can do it by torture and uh, flattery and counseling, all sorts of ways. So when we're not going into the full range of methods in this particular topic. Page three, if you jump right up to there after the, the definitional struggles there. Uh, I try to give you from reflection, so this is reflection going back to theory, my experience of working with many outstanding lawyers uh, in, in mediations over the last 25 years and, and as a lawyer before there. So here are some of, of uh, the stereotypes that I've seen of outstanding negotiators who are lawyers. Uh, bottom of page three, they have high attention uh, to the other people in the room. Attention by listening, by nodding, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, focus, appropriate eye contact. They are very big on training their teams by preparation. They meet beforehand 
And they talk about that. They say we had a meeting. Uh, they're gracious hosts. They serve great coffee. They serve beautiful sandwiches and, and usually try and meet in rooms with a lot of light coming in because they're trying to get people to stay. People who stay for longer talk more. Uh, they realize that there are, um, and they articulate, we can do this in different ways. We can use whiteboards. We can do diagrams. We can go for walks. Uh, they have a lot of self-deprecating humor, such as uh, I became a lawyer because I can't add, and I forgot to take my pills again this morning, and, and things like that, which help people to relax. They have a, an amazing balance between the big goals, what my client's trying to achieve, and fine detail. They can talk about minutiae, but back to, uh, I don't get lost in the forest. I'm back to my clients trying to achieve these big things. Um, many of them have a stunning memory for detail. And that way, way better than mine, they can produce documents when someone says, but that's not what I said in that email, is it? And they say, well, my memory may be faulty, but I'll see if I can find that document. And hey, presto, they find it. Uh, they create doubts usually politely on page four. They don't tend to have fake tantrums. Uh, they can handle people who are having fake or real tantrums, but they create doubt by nuance, by raised eyebrows, by saying we'd have some difficulty with that. Um, they're very patient. They're persistent. Uh, they have great questions. Could you tell me more about that? I'm confused. Could you elaborate upon that? A lot of open questions which are, are very impressive. And then closed questions. Uh, that seems to be different from what uh, was in your document that you sent to us. Uh, have I made a mistake? So there's a kind of politeness, but there's steel underneath that politeness. They're scrupulously honest, but they don't necessarily disclose everything. So honesty doesn't extend to saying everything, um, but they never ever lie. They, they preserve their reputation with a kind of uh, almost viciousness sometimes. Are you saying that I have misled you? I would just like to clarify this. Um, could we come outside for a moment? <laughs> and outside, they, they go for you and they say, I have been in practice for 33 years and I want you to know it's part of my practice to never mislead anyone. If I have, I apologize, but I want to tell you what was the basis of my statement. And they really go for the person because uh, reputation is key. They, they must preserve this reputation for their long-term usefulness in the negotiation industry. Uh, they, they are aware of the fallibilities of human decision making, though they usually have read no books <laughs> about this, but they are aware. I often make mistakes. I sometimes miss things. Um, are we making foolish assumptions here? And they're great at reevaluating fallbacks. If we don't get this, if we don't buy this warehouse, what are our fallbacks? If we don't get a settlement here, what are our fallbacks in the chain of litigation? So the stereotypes, let me tell you, we won't go into it, fit in with the research. The research is amazing, saying what are the features of outstanding negotiators in Western uh, cultures, and, and many of those features overlap with, with the research. Okay, I'm going to get you in a moment to do some exercises. Um, page five, the basic patterns of negotiation. We've talked about this in previous papers. Is You'll see a, a diagram there on page five. Is each of the parties has a preferred solution. I want 10 million, you want to only pay 2 million. I want an apology, you don't want any apology uh, anywhere visible. Um, I want you suspended from your professional practice, you don't want to be suspended or don't want bad reputation, and so on. So there's usually solutions offered to a particular uh, transaction or conflict. I want exclusive use of Jerusalem, you want exclusive use of Jerusalem, and so on. So the two um, solutions are then met with what we've seen before for doubt creation. Each party tries to lower the expectations of the other side. You'll see on page six that often the two solutions are more complex. They have multiple clauses, not just a million versus two million. It's usually damages plus restitution, return of the bulldozer, plus, plus, plus. And the other person has alternative lines of solutions. 
Having suggested solutions, people then engage, you'll see on page six, with this famous concept of creating doubt, lowering expectations, trying to get the other person or their own tribe to lower their expectations. We're not going to get everything we want, but can we get something that we can live with and, uh, and work with? And Dow creation is, is a great skill uh, conducted sometimes aggressively, but often with politeness and nuance. Uh, I'm going to give you some exercises straight away. On page 23 of the paper, we're jumping right ahead, there are a series of illustrations from mediations I was involved in and I want you to speculate on why people moved, why from their initial solutions they moved. All right, so page 23. So this was an elderly Italian couple who in classic fashion had come to Australia um, and they had settled on their dream farm and on the edge of the dream farm to one of their golden-haired daughters they allowed her to build a, um, a business, a childcare business. And that particular transaction took place without any documentation in the informal manner of allowing a relative to build a business at the corner of your farm. Um, that arrangement collapsed when she did the unthinkable and married an Australian. And, uh, and so the relationship between the parents and their daughter and the son-in-law broke down and uh, the, the father was outraged by the lack of respect coming from this daughter and the three grandchildren who lived next door. There were fights about lawn mowing and fences and so on. And so lawyers translated this into the doctrine of promissory estoppel. A promise had been made, detrimental reliance. They couldn't subdivide the property because it was illegal to subdivide it in that particular part of, this, of, of uh, the country. And so a lawsuit developed. <coughs> da daughter wanted this piece of property for herself or big, big damages. <coughs> the parents said, no, get out. It's our property. Uh, and so it was a very acrimonious kind of dispute and uh, suddenly in the course of the mediation, they accepted a written offer which gave the daughter most of what she wanted in terms of use of the property long term, control of the property, minimal rental and so on. Why? Why when people are so far apart, it's not your property, you can't have anything? I want the property, I want to run a business on it, then suddenly it changes. Any speculation on why this would occur? D okay, great. Doug's got the suggestion. Uh, the, the new set of goals come in. I would like to see my grandchildren regularly. <coughs> that certainly was discussed more. Any other reasons? Yes, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, maybe one of the couple got sick. Okay, here's a profound uh, insight. Uh, one of the couple, this is an elderly couple, uh, could have got sick from the pressure of negotiation, the pressure of the conflict. More? Anyone else? Why would someone suddenly move? What was the the power shift, the doubt that emerged that caused this to move? I'm giving you the answer, sorry. <laughs> Please, more. There could have been, so that was the hope, but there wa let me tell you there wasn't. Um, this, this, was, this was deep hurt long term. So this is what happened as far as one can work out. The elder couple's other daughter had warned them that the ongoing conflict was going to make them ill. So here's this, the stress, one of the results of one of the life goals is to be healthy, one of the results of conflict is stress, and had said to them they should make a generous offer and get out. Her prophecy was correct. So during the negotiation, it was a mediation, I still remember, the father became increasingly breathless and confused. So it was classified as a minor heart attack during the course of the mediation. Uh, they don't teach you about that at training courses on mediation. <laughs> And uh, they settled amidst many tears and bitterness, but <coughs> rationalised their behaviour on the basis that the elder daughter had recommend they do this in any case. Next. <coughs> Another mediation in the country area. A wife accepted an offer of two million payout in a matrimonial property dispute. So late at night, uh, the documents were drawn up. <coughs> Very, a lot of bitterness between her and her husband. Her husband worked in partnership with his brother. 
And uh, two mornings later, as often happens, there was post-settlement blues <coughs> and she went to her lawyer and changed her mind, said, I want to pull out. The lawyer said, you can't. You've signed a legal document, you're bound. <coughs> she said, I don't care about law, pull out. We're going to renege. So the lawyer was nervous that she'd complained to the law society about his behavior unless he followed her instructions. Um, <coughs> and so she said, oh, I was forced into the settlement. And the lawyer said, that argument won't work at law because you had two lawyers present the whole way through negotiation. There was a lot of discussion and you signed up. So the lawyer said, you will fail as a matter of rights. But in any case, she said, run the litigation in any case. Um, and so at the, uh, one year later, at the door of the court, the husband's expert valuer, valuing his farming properties, was discredited because it was discovered that he had a conflict of interest. He'd once owned shares in a company uh, that was owned by the husband. So suddenly, <coughs> the husband said, oh, I'll give you 2.5 million. And uh, the offer was accepted. Why did he suddenly up the offer? What had shifted? What new life goal? What could possibly have happened to pay outside the legal range? So his lawyers, his lawyers are saying, don't do this, don't do this. She will relationship. never get two million. Yes. A new relationship. Great. First hypothesis, new relationship. He wanted to get rid of this old uh, troubles and have a life, possibly. Yes. Um, the husband was worried that she'd find out about his other assets. Great. So that he had another pile of assets offshore and if the litigation went on, maybe these would be un unearthed more. Someone wanted to buy the business. Someone wanted to buy, just which business? His business? His business. Okay, so someone wanted to buy his business, so he wanted to make sure that he was free to sell more. New, new facts emerge, new yeah, goals. Ah, uh, okay, rude and, <laughs> rude and lewd pictures of him, which will uh, discredit him in the community. Yes, so new facts emerge. Okay, so as far as we could tell, it's always interesting to be involved in these. This is what happened. <coughs> the husband and his brother wanted to subdivide the farm and they had possibilities, good possibilities of subdividing and they needed financial certainty to be able to approach the bank and get loans and uh, they also were nervous about assets being revalued if this uh, subdivision went through so they wanted to clean it up so they could go to the bank and get the loans and not have a reevaluation occur. Power exercise three, <coughs> it's a mediation about the division of 14.5 million and the lawyer, and the, the husband here was in horse racing, he was an interesting character. Um, the lawyers, and the hu for both the husband and wife, which I find often happens in these uh, cases, they agreed on the range. So this is an important concept is facts, evidence, rules, range. They agree on range. And so they say the range is, given uh, a prediction of the behavior of a bureaucrat in court, 20 to 33 percent. So the husband, gets in the range, his first offer was 19. The wife, remember, what we talked about, insult offers, no market support, wife says I want 40%. Both the lawyers look at her and say, no, 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 you'll never get 40%. You're offering way outside the range of what would happen if your rights were pursued in a court. She says, no, 40. The husband then breaks every rule of negotiation and starts to bid against himself. 19, 25, 30, his lawyers throwing up on the floor. <laughs> 32, why? What the heck is going on? He's a very smart operator. He's no fool. He's not in wild emotion. He is a smart negotiator. He's breaking the fundamental rule. Never bid against yourself. And don't start bidding when someone starts in the insult range. He's breaking all the rules, why? Why would you speculate? Because I was the mediator, both the lawyers, their jaws were dropping. What is going on? So we didn't know what was going on. He wanted to get it done for some reason. He wanted to get it done for some reason. So yes. He had more assets so back, great. So back to the speculation. Maybe he had more assets, but he clearly there was something going on where he wanted to get it done. Anyone else think it's very similar in a way to the, the other one? We never found out. Everyone asked questions. And we never found out. Um, he was behaving in rights talk very foolishly. He was outside the legal range. He was behaving foolishly. 
but in commercial world he was behaving and appeared wisely and this was a speculation. Uh, he wanted again to obtain loans to buy some more horses for another horse racing venture. The banks say clean up your life and we'll give you the loans. And the other thing is his wife had such a great fallback position. She had a home, she was living close to friends, uh, she was being supported. So she, her fallback position is I'll do nothing for two years and bleed you. So she wasn't in pain in her fallback position. He was in a lot of pain and so he bid against himself. Last one. Oh, this was a great, this is great. This, uh, uh, this is a cane farm, sugar cane farm. And the parties went to litigation. So this was post-litigation mediation. Um, and the, the division in court was um, 52 to 42. The, the farmer got 52% of the value of the cane farm and his wife got 48%, but the wife got the farm in the 48. So, so the judge gave her the farm and their son who had worked the farm with his wife was also left on the farm. However, the judge couldn't add, he went to law school and he made a mathematical error. He should have played out what lawyers call quantum merit, when in doubt speak Latin, um, a, a fair wages payment. Because the son had worked on the farm for 18 years without getting paid except for gasoline for his Subaru. And so um, the judge did his maths based upon wages for workers on cane farms and got it all wrong. The parties went back to the judge and said, excuse me, judge, could you just correct your maths? He said, no, my judgment is my judgment. I'm not correcting it. So the parties were left with the possibility of appeal or come to negotiation and fix it. So they came to negotiation and the husband walked in and said, oh, I've changed my mind, I want 57%, <laughs> not 52. So both the lawyers once again said, no, you can't ch claim 57. You've already <laughs> got 52. That's what you you're entitled to as a matter of rights. All we hear is decide what to pay the son. He said, I'm paying the son zero. They said, you can't do that because the judge said the son's entitled to 18 years wages. And uh, they said, no, zero is the number. Son, I hate him, he gets zero. So two responses which were illegal, outside the range, 57, zero. So the parties negotiated back and forth and the, the father um, was a tough guy. He was a very lonely guy, he carried a gun. And uh, he, he ha had a motorcycle and he used to ride it around the farm. There were injunctions against him, prohibiting him from going on the farm. So the negotiation went on and we did a lot of diagrams on the board uh, with the son and his wife and the mother. And suddenly they said, uh, we'll take it. 57, we'll give him 57, we'll take 43 and we'll get zero for wages. Oh, the lawyers again were lying on the floor saying, you can't do this, uh, this is outside the range, you have rights, you are ignoring your rights. Why? Why they take the outrageous package? Zero wages for 18 years work. And say again? Someone wanted to buy the farm. Okay, so can I just encourage you to write down here the great words that negotiators love is are you prepared to pay a premium? Premium is the word business people. Are you prepared to take a discount to achieve your goals? Pay a premium to achieve your goals, take a discount. And this mum and her son and the daughter-in-law were smart operators. Uh, they did the maths on the board. They said, if we get the farm, um, we can run it efficiently. We can um, create a profit margin in a couple of years, which will more than compensate us for the missing 18 years of wages. They recalculated on the board when I was there. We worked it through. They could have a million net in two years, whereas the enraged Sicilian husband had nothing else to do to run litigation and appeals for the next two years. He was a lonely guy, had nothing else to do. He was time rich. Negotiation with time rich people, they have a good fallback, they've got nothing else to do. So they did their maths and said, we will take a rights loss to get a business gain. We will take a premium. So this, uh, these were important illustrations to me and to the lawyers who were very opposed to their clients doing this kind of thing. Okay, so a lot of lessons to be taken from the negotiations you're involved in. So back to, <coughs> uh, those, those are the illustrations, back to the three kinds of talk to create doubt. The three kinds of talk that you would supervise and clarify as a mediator or clarify and communicate 
as a negotiator. Rights talk, goals talk, and power talk. And of course these overlap, but sometimes it's helpful to, to work with clients and say, uh, these are the doubts that you are raising. Am I correct? So, page eight. We're constantly asking the question, what are our fallback positions, top paragraph, if we don't get a deal here? What are our fallback positions using our rights, our goals? And remember we did the class on the opposite to goals is risks, so you need this linguistic ability to switch back and forth. My goal is speed, the risk is delay. My goal is minimal publicity, the risk is maximum publicity. So you must be able to, to do all these kinds of doubt talks and risk evaluations. All right, page eight. Rights talk. What's a right? Page eight. A right is a series of guesses. A series of guesses, okay? About the range of benefits and losses which may result from legal process and decision making. So we're making a guess as to how a bureaucrat, someone who processes multiple events according to rules, will behave in two weeks' time or two years' time. We're making a guess. We're talking about range. We're never talking about a fixed number. So the people who make these uh, rights guesses hopefully are experts. They've been involved many times in guessing how judges behave. And those of you who are lawyers, you know that guessing how judges behave is, is a lose game. Um, and, and I have guessed many times and been so wrong uh, that uh, it's quite a challenge about the nature of being a human being. Um, so clients who talk about justice, rights, entitlement or fairness are very unpersuasive in negotiations. If you use the word fair, just, entitled, right, it's, ju it's just, uh, they're called boo and hurrah words. They, they don't progress the negotiation, but they may help the client to talk about fairness. But you've got to dissuade the client of talking about, oh, I just want a fair outcome in the meeting because fairness has so many meanings. So middle of page eight, uh, I've been working with some lawyers who are, are wonderful because they give legal advice in three sentences and they do it in writing and they're extremely impressive. Um, and, and their three sentences go in the middle of page eight. I've advised my client, they're telling the truth here, that she will receive between 20 to 40 percent of the estate, so there's the range, incurring legal costs of between $80,000 and $120,000, there's a range of costs with a delay of between 15 and 24 months. So that's superb legal advice, not, not 40 pages of blah blah, three sentences of ranges of fin gross financial outcome expenditure of legal costs and the time in before you get this piece of paper. It says nothing about whether you'll collect, it just says whether I'll get a piece of paper which says you can supposedly collect the between 20 to 40 percent. So rights talk. Uh, interesting. Okay, tell me what page you're on please. Ten. Okay, so page 10 is where it says rights talk? Yeah. Oh, great, okay, thank you. Um, so plus two. Um, so on the board you've got rights talk emphasizes facts. This is our, un notice of language, this is our understanding of the facts. Uh, this is, the f these are the facts we are working on. And then the doubt, we seem to be working on different facts uh, we have a different version to that. Predictably, our versions are far apart. So the nice language of the negotiators. So rights talk depends on facts. What's your evidence to support that opinion? Who would be believed? Credibility. Which rules are you applying? Which are the versions of the rules you're applying at the moment? Uh, which policy of the department? Uh, these are the rules given that I've worked in this field for 20 years. I know that's what the rules say, number four, but this is how the rules are interpreted. You should know insider knowledge. Publicity and reputation, some of the rights talk delay, how long this will take. Um, and then cost direct, out-of-pocket costs paid to lawyers or valuers or accountants, indirect costs, how long you'll be away from your workplace, stress, 
litigation stress, how you will fare uh, preparing documents for uh, two years, um, the unpredictability of judicial behaviour, litigation is brain surgery with an axe, uh, litigation is a lottery, and all these kinds of phrases that you need to have in your repertoire as a good negotiator. And sometimes you have statistics to help that. Um, judicial ignorance, you know judges know nothing about the university. You know judges know nothing about computing. You know judges are making um, decisions on topics they know nothing about. I have a friend who's a judge and he sometimes calls the counsel up to talk to him and he says, if you knew what I knew and what I know, you wouldn't let me be making this decision. In other words, <laughs> He hasn't got a clue what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so here are some, and loss of control, very important. In litigation, lawyers will tell you, you lose control. As you leave the negotiations, you lose control. Professionals take over and uh, they tell you what to do and they tell you what forms to fill in, they tell you what to say. Uh, so if you want control, stay here. Um, so rights talk um, may be influential for some of your clients. They may, it may define the range, but we've already seen from those examples, even if the range is defined, people may decide for commercial reasons, so the next one, for goals reasons, to go outside the, the rights range. So this is goals talk, we've looked at it before. Business people are particularly interested in goals talk, because that's how they're trained. What are the goals of the business? Can we forward the goal? They're very distrustful of lawyers because lawyers talk about rights. They know rights are unpredictable and they do not want to lose control of their business to another group of professionals. So business people, it's said, are much more persuaded by goal and risk talk. So there you've got some of the goals that are standard. You can show this sheet to some of your parties and say, are in any of these your goals? To settle soon, to keep control, uh, banks to avoid an awkward precedent, to avoid floodgate, very important for insurers, I have this goal, um, to sustain good business and personal relationships, so I'll take a discount because I want to sustain good business and personal relationships, and so on. Um, number nine you've got there, to keep the decision making in the hands of industry experts. Um, number ten is very important, to stop my business partners being subpoenaed, to stop their names appearing in the press, to stop them being asked to fill in documents on my behalf, and, uh, and so on. So goal talk needs to be prepared and decide who is going to present it, to whom, when, where, with what sort of language. Harsh, graphs, soft. Um, You'll see on page, I think it's 13 on your paper, since we're working on different printouts, uh, you'll see that there is a famous quote from an Australian judge, uh, Justice Fitzgerald, which is sometimes given out dur during mediations in Australia when lawyers are po pontificating about rights. Lawyers are persuaded by judicial statements rather than by statistics. Businesses are much more interested in statistics so there is a great statement about the unpredictability of judicial behaviour from a highly respected um, judge, Justice Fitzgerald. And, and as people are raving on about, but my client's entitled to, uh, you can say there's a lot of talk about rights and entitlement here. Could uh, we talk about ranges? This is what Justice Fitzgerald said about predictability and control. Then we get to power talk. And on uh, page, I think it'll be your page 13, uh, power is sometimes seen as an obscene topic, as something to do with the mafia, as to do with manipulation, but power is a fact of life, as people are more powerful, less powerful. There are many different forms of power. Your little bubblegum card gives you some of the forms of power that exist as you walk into any negotiation room or as you make phone calls or send emails. Multiple forms of power. They're not ignoble. They're sometimes illegal when you use them, but they're not in themselves ignoble. So power has many forms, many forms and many layers. And here is the interesting thing. Power shifts with the passage of time. Power shifts with the passage of time. So in, in uh, 
case of employment disputes when someone threatens to put the, pull the skeletons out of the cupboard for the employer. They may have power until they disclose to the press those skeletons because at that moment they've lost the power, they've fired the cannon, they don't have any extra bits to disclose. Uh, so power is a strange thing. It, once exercised, it sometimes changes in its nature. And so you've got the categories of power which need to be taken into account, particularly when you're preparing for a negotiation. Uh, in mediation, when I ask people in the intake what could go wrong at the meeting, they often talk about these kinds of things. Um, the other side is much more persistent than I am. Um, I get worn out. Um, I'm an emotional person. I sometimes feel embarrassed by the degree of emotion that I express and I lose track. Um, they're very powerful because they don't care. Risk, they're risk takers. I have a life to lead, a family to raise, a house, a mortgage to pay. I'm not willing to take risks. So they can really take me for a ride by threatening to spin out this conflict. So the terrifying uh, is, is version of that is scorched earth. The, the terrifying form of power that you should be aware of is, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. But you'll wreck the business, I don't care. Uh, but you'll go bankrupt, I don't care. Uh, a negotiator who is saying that truthfully is a very powerful person. Um, and uh, you, your goal as a negotiator is to find a goal in their lives that they do care about, their grandchild, um, their status in the prison as a tough guy, um, how to affect that status. You're looking for some goal beyond I don't care. Um, so these go on to page 16, the different forms of power. If you just look through those and maybe put a circle around ones that you've seen play themselves out as being important in negotiations that you've gone to. Example, in native title disputes in Australia, number 18 is very powerful. So one of my friends uh, who's a native title negotiator and mediator, he, w he relates the story often of how he went and into a room with a lot of uh, Aboriginal people and high-flying lawyers and, and farmers and they sat there and they were going around the table, each of them telling their story and so he said to one of the Aboriginal uh, guys who was there, so can you tell me what brings you here today? And there was a pause and the fellow said, well, Lawrence, it all began in 1788. <laughs> and you can imagine the pall that settled over the room. So he was a time-rich negotiator. He was going to break the rest of the people because Westerners were very time poor. Okay, so I don't know which one of those you see most often. The, on page 17, I mentioned to you the ones that I see being very powerful in my little world, my closet, are 6, 23, 24, and 25. 6 is the I don't care, scorched earth kind of person. But 23, 24, and tw 25 I see as power moves that have profound effect in creating doubt. The skeletons in the closet, let me tell you. So one of the lawyers I used to work for, he says, I don't, I don't negotiate ever, John, until I have something on the other side. I said, what is that? He was a really good lawyer, let me tell you. He says, well, if I just do a rights analysis, we always end up, we have different rights analysis, so we're way apart. I have to get something on the other side. So I said, what does get something mean? I have to find an estranged employee, I have to find an estranged spouse, and then I go and interview them. And when I've got something on the other side, I be continue the negotiation. And then he had this amazing routine at, at the door of the court, which I used to watch with in awe because you know, the one wanted a million and the other was, was willing to pay half a million. So he'd walk up to the person very close, right at the door of the court. So adjournment was not a possibility. And John would say to the lawyer, I've got some good news and some bad news for you. The other lawyer had seen this routine before, so he's filled with fear. <laughs> so the good news is we're going to settle today. 
the bad news is your client's been a very bad boy. And the lawyer would go into a panic because you'd see them rush off to the other room to talk to the client. What haven't you told me? Furious discussion. And, then, and, and they'd come back. You haven't got anything on him. Ask him about Hong Kong. Race back. Furious discussion. Those were minor incidents. Hmm. Yes, we have the photographs. Uh, so it was, it was straight a form of extortion under the criminal code, but it was conducted in a way that it wasn't extortion. Because, uh, and and they were, he would get settlements. So his statement to his client, I'll never negotiate unless I've got something on, something on the other side, which was a power. It was particularly 23. Remember Conan Doyle, behind every great fortune is a great crime. He worked on that proposition. And I will find the crime and I will use it. Behind every great fortune is a great crime. So power discussions, very important to have in your, in your repertoire. Now we get to Cialdini. Cialdini. Robert Cialdini is one of the social psychologists from the United States, particularly from Columbia and New York and Missouri. These are very impressive people. Uh, who study the behavior of groups and individuals in negotiation. And so Cialdini uh, wrote this little book called Influence. It's had many editions. It was a bit of a sleeper to start with. And he says, in cross-cultural studies of transactions, not of conflicts, of transactions, here are the six persuasive features. They overlap with goals and power. But they're very interesting. I've, I've used these as a mediator as I puzzle. What on earth are we going to do here? Okay. So I try and give you illustrations um, in Appendix B at the back of the book. So we're on about page 15, Cialdini sales levers. Let me walk you through. Uh, these, are, these are good to think about. So consistency. This is a great principle that is that human beings like to act consistently with things that are important to them. You, if, if education of your children is important, you will spend money on a laptop computer. In the old days, it used to be on Encyclopedia Britannicus. So the key is to ask people questions and listen, listen, listen. Find out what's important to them and then make offers which are consistent with what's important to them. Um, I understand it's very important for you uh, to be well respected in the community. So what if we were able to construct a solution that uh, gave you uh, the glory for settling this dispute. You tr find out what's important and you make the offers um, in relation to what they've said is important. So that requires great listening skills and good questioning skills to, s to find out what drives people. Next, the authority principle. Lawyers, this is like rights. Is human beings are profoundly persuaded by 69% of dentists brush their teeth with Colgate. What do the authority figures do? Uh, so it's great to have um, quotes from child development experts, from farmers, to say how they manage this particular disaster. Uh, here is the expert commission of farmers who in 1999 put out this uh, report. And this is how to manage this particular disease um, uh, within cattle. So authority, people are impressed by authority. But of course, you then get to one of the topics we're dealing with later, dueling experts. What if they produce um, inconsistent authorities? Reciprocity, you all know about this. Human beings are profoundly influenced to give back when you've given to them first. So you give the nice room for the negotiation. You give the coffee free. You give the sandwiches for lunch. You give politeness. You'll get back politeness. Uh, I think I mentioned to you one of the early lawyers I worked for, Fraser, used to take a bottle of wine and a fistful of glasses to each negotiation and he'd put them on the table, standing there symbolically and people would say, always, Fraser, what's that for? That's what we're going to drink when we're finished here today. He gave something initially. He didn't read Cialdini, uh, but you know it with Hare Krishna, you know it with many, many charities. They give you things and there is a sense of obligation to give back. This one's a bit threatening. Uh, maybe in, in multicultural Canada it's a bit threatening. Uh, Cialdini's research confirmed many times is that we are persuaded by people who are like us. We're persuaded by people who are like us. So if they are, they're wearing a suit, you wear a suit. 
If they're wearing jeans, you wear jeans. If they send along a young person, you find a young person to go along. If they send along someone who's interested in ice hockey, you send along someone who's interested in ice hockey. People are persuaded by people who are like them. Scarcity, you all know about this, very important as a mediator, I use it all the time. This is a rare opportunity. We have seven people gathered here today. This will not happen again. We have 12 hours. Do not waste this time. When we leave here, you will be back in the wilderness of lawyers' letters. So this is a pre-Christmas sale. We have seven days in which this is for sale and then it's gone. There are only three Cadillacs left in Saskatchewan of this kind. So you create scarcity to create attraction. It's very important that you think through how I can create scarcity of time or money or opportunity. And the reverse of that is, is of course very powerful. Uh, Cialdini notices that people who have nothing to lose. So this is back to the power. Oh, I don't care whether I sell a house or not. It's a lovely house. If I don't sell it, I'm just going to stay here. But wouldn't you like to move on to the nursing home? No, I'd rather stay here. Um, so there's no fallback position, which is a problem. They have a great fallback position, which is nothing to lose. Coalition, great principle also. Gialdini, and you would be aware of this, and this is why people who go to contentious meetings meet beforehand with the factions and arrive at the meeting with a coalition. They say, they say uh, we've talked beforehand and 43% of us agree with this resolution. It's very difficult to break down a coalition once it has formed because people lose face. So the lawyer I used to work for, she was a great negotiator and I, I worked with her for many years and she used this. She would go to negotiations and use the bumbling Columbo routine as well and she would say, oh well I've asked for opinions from six of the partners of the law firm and I just have got these opinions, here, here they are, they answer this email and so they have set out what their opinion is as to the range in this particular situation. Well, the six partners would have different ranges, but they would, they would narrow the range. The result is you couldn't break that coalition. The, the other side would go back and say, well, we've got a problem because in no way will they be able to persuade six partners to change their, their views. So in, in Appendix B, you'll see some of the applications that I've tried to extract from Cialdini's uh, work. Um, I'll tell you the story. Uh, uh, we lived on the beach in the Gold Coast and uh, over the road from us there was a man, Mark, who lived alone in a house and he was separated from his wife and four kids. And Mark had many personality disorders and he was a very dangerous guy. He was a violent bloke. And he used to play dreadful music late at night. Um, Enkelberg Hunk Humperdinck, I think, was one of his favourites. And so this music would blaze across the street. The neighbours were scared of him. So one night I was sitting there doing some work late at night, 10.30, and on comes this terrible music. And look out the window and there's Mark sitting on the front veranda and this, this speaker's blazing. So I thought, so what would Robert Cialdini do? I've got to try and talk to this guy. And I thought through, I worked out a speech. And so I walked across the street, it was dark. It was like, I felt like Gary Cooper and it was high noon and uh, went up to the front picket fence and said, Mark, could I talk to you? He stood up, he's a big guy, he walks down, he stands, folds his arm and just looks at me, he doesn't say a word. I said, Mark, we've had some difficulties with the, uh, the music that's been playing, would you be prepared to turn it off? No. That went well. <laughs> um, so then I tried my speech, because I'd worked it out, I'd worked out number three. Mark, my wife and I, uh, we live in this neighbourhood and when your four children come to visit, we really like children so we keep an eye on them because this road's sometimes busy. So as they're playing on the street, uh, we like to make sure they're safe um, because we'd like to live in a, a good community. And so in return, we'd like you to look after us as well because we're getting older and we both have jobs and we need to sleep at night. So we need to have some quiet at night. I finished my speech, there was silence. It just stared me down, not a word. I turned around, walked across the street, got halfway across the street and the music went off. And here, everyone, I became the hero of the street. It, <laughs> it never came on again. So Robert Cialdini 
sometimes the theories work. <laughs> Not often, but it worked there. So reciprocity created a false reciprocity. It was waffle, but we have given something to you. Can you give something back to us in return? And the answer was for him, yes. Okay. Um, he, he was, it was dangerous too, but uh, he committed suicide a few years later. Um, so persuasion is complicated by pause. You will have all experienced this. As you have your persuasion, your goals and your rights um, and your power persuasion worked out in soft words, uh, you will see on the bottom of page 17, I think, in your work, is one of the standard strategies used in response is adjournment. Oh, we'll get back to you on that, John. Oh, we'll get instructions from our clients. Oh, uh, we need to have a break. Oh, we couldn't settle today. Oh, we don't have authority to settle. So blah, 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 blah. We need more facts before we could settle. So people retreat from your skillful persuasion by saying, we'll think about it. And often that's because they've been lazy, they're disorganized, um, they fear regrets, they've got to deal with uh, critics in the background. So on page 18, that talks about that. So um, adjournments and procrastination are an easy response to creating doubt. And that's why some lawyers wait to the door of the court because adjournment is difficult. It's hard to go into the, the judge and say, Your Honour, we're not prepared to go ahead today, we'd like an adjournment. Usually judges will punish you for that. Um, so an auctioneers, they like to wait until the day of the auction uh, before talking turkey because they don't want to waste time on negotiations when people can pull back and say, I'll think about it, I'll think about it. So persuasion and installers, uh, insurers particularly, they stall until um, the door of the court to make big payouts because they're hoping things will change. They don't want to make decisions early. They want facts, 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 evidence, evidence. Um, and they want to hang on to the money because they're making interest on your money. Um, so it's complicated by pause. It's complicated, uh, page 18, by deception. Deception, which is part of negotiation. People are telling you half-truths or telling you lies um, or making negligent statements. So the research on lawyers here is very depressing, you guys. It's the research on um, done again by this group of social psychologists in the United States, uh, that lawyers standardly lie. They have a group of lies that we standardly tell, and, um, and some, of the, some of the lies... This is my bottom line, this is my best offer, this is a reasonable offer, we will do better in court. If you don't accept this offer, we're going to court. We have expert X's advice which supports this claim unequivocally. Lie, 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 lie. Okay, so lawyers are saying these all the time. They're just straight lies. But they're said so often that no one believes them in any case, so are they lies when no one believes you when, they, when you lie? <laughs> so, but there's a whole range of other things that the researchers have found that we as lawyers do, which are clearly illegal, illegal. They're misre false rep rep misrepresentations, either fraudulent or negligent, and that could lead to our clients' settlements being set aside. Um, or they are negligent or their half-truths. In Australia, the Trade Practices Act catches half-truths. And so lawyers uh, are even more nervous about what they're saying standardly. These things that we do as lawyers or as clients are known as eants. It sounds like it's out of Star Wars. Eants, ethically ambiguous negotiation tactics. Eants, I've given you a list of eants on page 28. And that's worth looking at the standard behaviors that are ethically ambiguous. So that's a nice acronym to play around with. And, and you'll see there's a category of standard EANTs. So the question is in each country, um, are these in somehow improper or are they so normal? So in France, lying is very normal in negotiation, culturally much more normal than it is even in the United States and Canada. So the questions that you've got uh, up on page 30, which of the EANTs is currently unethical on which school of ethics, which is illegal, in which cultures and jurisdictions with what consequences? So the vast array of these um, EANTs that we engage in, which have no legal or ethical consequence because nothing follows from that they have a big marketplace consequence in that our reputation is tainted and that people won't deal with us or believe our beautifully crafted doubts. 
So creating doubt through power, rights and goals is sometimes complicated by deception. And it's not just deception of others, it's deception of self. So um, this, on page 19, we've done this in one of the previous talks. The social psychologists who look at us say lawyers are very amateurish. We don't understand that decision making involves self-deception, what's called decision traps. And there are a whole bunch of these decision traps which we looked at in a previous um, breakfast, which should be part of our discussion with self and with others. Are we too confident here? Do we believe that this is just about dollars? Are we too wed to the status quo in this organization? Do we see what we want to see when we look for evidence? Have we framed the question to be resolved here wrongly? So at least to be aware of these so that we ask, are we deceiving ourselves in the way we make decisions? These are all worth uh, reflection and many PhDs, many great books are written on self-deception through what's called the decision traps. On page 19, there's a little, uh, it'll be 21 on your sheet, there's a nice uh, set of tests for you, for you to try to work out in a list of statements which decision trap appears to be made in that series of tests. So number one, they want to talk about future business. What a waste of time. This dispute is just about money. So here is the decision trap. To simplify complexity, we say this is just a fixed pie. Life is just every dollar I get is a dollar you don't get. Um, that simplifies life, but life ain't about that. Life is more complicated than this is just about money. Okay, page 21. Uh, not only do we, oh, I just mentioned to you again because this is, is very important, if I can get it to go back. The last decision trap is reactive devaluation. Uh, reactive devaluation needs to be discussed more and more. Good offers from people we don't like are considered to be bad offers. So who should make the good offer? Or who should raise the legitimate doubts? Who should talk about rights? And probably the answer is mostly not lawyers because we're not trusted. Therefore, find out someone else who can make the good statement. A good statement from the wrong person is a bad statement. Uh, lots, lots of research on that. Okay, the wrapping. Wrapping of the substantive message comes also uh, in emotional messages and procedural messages. So uh, the wrapping, we could have many books, many discussions about. If you get the wrapping wrong, uh, you get a lot wrong. The message is, has to have the right wrapping. So page 22, you watch good negotiators and they are aware of the emotions and the emotional content of the upset in the room of the anger in the room. So you see the skills, page 22, they listen respectfully, they acknowledge emotion, I can see this is important to you, I can see you were disappointed, that was obviously a frustrating experience, the fact they didn't answer your emails uh, caused you a lot of grief, they identify the emotion and acknowledge it. Uh, they're able to reframe this concept of turning the picture frame into a different set of words than is presented. Uh, you were disappointed, your expect rather than call it a breach of contract, there were many disappointed expectations. They're great at asking questions. Procedurally, you'll see on page 23, the great negotiator wraps the substantive messages in procedural awareness. People want emotional justice, they want procedural justice, and they want a measure of substantive justice. So they, the, every team needs a procedural freak, page 23. Procedural freak uses phrases like, I was wondering, it would be helpful to me. I'm lost, could we pause for a minute? I know I'm a bit slow, but could you summarize that for me again? Uh, we've been on that topic for 15 emails. Could we address this other topic and we'll come back to that? So they are aware of where people are in the procedure. Uh, they are rising above the fray and observing. They are what's called a quasi-mediator 
and they are wrapping the message in procedural um, awareness also. So, conclusion, page 24. Uh, the, the anecdotal, this is I'm reading under the conclusion, the anecdotal and more systematic study of persuasion methods using negotiation is helpful. You get frameworks, you get coat hangers, you get Cialdini's labels, but it's daunting. So it's very helpful to have categories so you can talk to one another and I can talk to you. So competence is demystified to some extent, but you're also left with a black box that having exercised competence things happen which you are not really aware of what's going on, either this helped or it didn't help. So I've called it there the persuasion soup. You can get the mixtures for the persuasion soup. You can up your competence, but the actual content is sometimes remains a mystery. I just recommend to you that if you can identify good negotiators in your organisation, to try to trail them, watch them, uh, listen to their language, um, I think those role models become sort of the theory in the flesh and that's what's extremely helpful for, for, for learning. Um, so just more diagrams right at the end. You can get a concept, you can turn it into language and you can change your behaviour and you can do it by telling stories. Lawyers particularly, we love stories. By systems, like in this paper, or by becoming a statistician. What behaviour statistically seems to lead to uh, results. So um, thanks very much. If there are any questions, uh, you, we've got maybe two minutes to ask a question. I realise people have lives and jobs to flee to. So maybe see you again uh, in February uh, for the last two, two modules that we're doing. We're doing them on dueling experts and managing outside tribes and influences. So I may see you then. Thank you very much.